Hello and welcome to Play On, the Morgan Sports Law podcast. I'm Ben Cisneros, a trainee solicitor at Morgan Sports Law, and I'm joined by my colleague Donna Bartley, who's a senior associate at the firm. In this episode, we'll be discussing Rule 40 of the Olympic Charter and the restrictions it places on athletes' exploitation and commercialisation of their own image during and around the Olympic Games. To help us do that, I'm delighted to say that we're joined by two special guests, Carla Borger and Rob Keeler. Carla is a German beach volleyball player who competed at the 2016 and 2020 Olympics and who in August won a bronze medal at the European Championships. Carla was one of the athletes who led a successful legal challenge to Rule 40 in Germany in 2017, which is something we'll discuss in detail later on. Welcome, Carla. It's great to have you with us. Thank you very much, Ben. Hi, everybody. Rob is the Director General of Global Athlete, an independent athlete-led organisation representing the interests of athletes worldwide. Global Athlete itself supported British athletes in their legal challenge to Rule 40 here in the UK back in 2019. Thank you, Rob, for joining us. Pleasure to be with you, Ben. So by way of introduction, Bylaw 3 of Rule 40 of the Olympic Charter has historically placed draconian limits on the ability of athletes to allow their image to be used for advertising purposes during the Olympic Games. Over time, that rule has somewhat softened and now provides that competitors who participate in the Olympic Games may allow their person, name, picture or sports performances to be used for advertising purposes during the Olympic Games in accordance with the principles determined by the IOC Executive Board. As I've already mentioned, legal challenges by athletes in Germany and the UK have have seemingly played a role in this relaxation of the rule, though restrictions do remain and approaches now differ between national Olympic committees. So Carla, if I could start with you, at a fundamental level, why is it important for athletes to be able to allow their image to be used for advertising purposes during the Olympics? Yeah, especially for the minority sports. It's very, the Olympics, um, the presentation of the athletes is like really, really important in that period. And if you see, for example, in Germany, I think in the whole world, every four years when it comes to the Olympics, uh, there's so much focus on you. So it's a time of your life in order to be visible and uh, present, yeah, in especially minority sports. Rob, is there anything you'd add to that about what exactly athletes get from this? Yeah, I I think I would even take a step back even further. It's mind-boggling how restrictive the IOC and, and by extension the IPC is in terms of athlete compensation. So if you look at athletes attending the games, uh, the IOC brings in about $1.4 billion a year, not million, a billion, of that less than 0.5% go directly to athletes, and athletes go to the games and they're not compensated. So they haven't compensated them to go to the games, and then when you go to the games, we're going to not allow you to find your own sponsorship to have your own people backing you during the games themselves. So they've restricted trade completely from the athletes' perspective. And that's why I think what Athletes Germany had done and and they bring it to the courts to have it it relaxed is a step forward, but nearly not far enough uh, to date. So it's, it's totally restrictive. It's unacceptable and it does need to change. Thanks, Rob. That was a very nice introduction, I think. Donna, is there any sort of introductory general remarks you'd want to add to that? Well, just to reiterate what both Carla and Rob have said, the, 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 the profile that you can get from the Olympic Games really is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity potentially for these athletes and in particular in, in minority sports and, and you know remembering that many of these athletes, even in the big sports, are not necessarily you know, well-paid outside of their sponsorship opportunities. So allowing those athletes to maximise that is, is, is really important. And in particular, as Rob said, in circumstances where they're not compensated for participating in the Olympics because there's no prize money involved. Yeah, I think we can we can all agree on that. And Rob, if I could come back to you then to specifically talk about the Tokyo Games, to what extent were athletes able to exploit their image during those games? Because as we mentioned at the outset, the rules have somewhat relaxed. They have relaxed, but I mean, if you look at the 206 National Olympic Committees, uh, there was approximately around 10 that uh, informed their athletes on what they could and could not do. And, and we've worked a spreadsheet out and, and, you know, being allowed to thank the sponsor a few times on Twitter, it's comical. 
it's it's laughable having pre-approval of certain advertisements has been administratively huge burdens on athletes so it's actually built and almost set up to fail for the athletes themselves and to yield benefit there hasn't been a lot that we have noticed during the Tokyo games because that restrictive nature to the approach on, on the relaxation. So I always say that, you know, when they changed the rules in rule 40, they changed it from a negative statement to a positive statement. When they announced they were relaxing rule 40 to the world, to, uh, to athletes to leverage their sponsorship ability, all of these things are headline grabbers. So they look good. They feel good. But when you read them and athletes apply them, not much has changed. And that's what the IOC is famous for, grabbing headlines to think athletes' rights are being enhanced when, in fact, they aren't. So I don't think we've seen or saw much progress during the Tokyo Games, to be quite frank. And, Carla, does that sort of marry up with your experience of Tokyo? How, how was it from, from your perspective as an athlete? Yeah, especially in 2016, uh, my first Olympics in uh, Rio, I was really confused because there were so many restrictions and I couldn't even read everything. Like I was really starting because it's your first Olympics and you want to do everything right. So I started reading all the papers and I was actually really afraid to do something wrong over there. So 2016, I actually stopped my social media because I was afraid doing something wrong. And um, yeah, so I was really happy in Tokyo that at least some parts, but it were really tiny parts, were a little um, more relaxed. But for example, you're not allowed to have uh, or create moving um, images, which actually everybody was doing now in Tokyo. I knew that it's forbidden, so I was uh, sticking to the rules or to Rule 40. But um, yeah, it's weird because we are in the social media world right now, so everything works with videos and um yeah we couldn't share anything with our fans with our family um and it was pretty sad and there are so many restrictions it's really a ton of paperwork before the olympics you guys can imagine like you are so focused on your sport that um reading all the papers uh and repeating the papers you're not allowed to use this hashtag no videos from there no um rings over here so it's it's confusing and i think yeah Germany, at, at least this year or uh, this year for Tokyo, we were permitted to have sponsors or um, do advertisements somehow. But I think sponsors didn't know this before. And um, through all the paperwork, uh, it, it really scared all the sponsors to do something. And it also limited their creativity. So um, I think there's still so much to, to change. And especially, uh, I think, just us in Germany, we were allowed to do it. I don't remember, maybe the UK athletes as well. But um, if you imagine that we were more allowed to do than other countries, I think we are having a step forward, but it's just a little step. So we really have to continue working on this. I think that's a really interesting point that not only athletes are put off from, you know, going to to the lengths to obtain some advertising deals or, or, or put out material, but actually advertisers themselves just don't want to get involved because it's too much hassle for them. And, and Donna, I, I wonder, just picking up on that and the, the point that Carla made about social media, whether maybe you, you think that the rule is even more punitive now that we live in this age of social media. Yeah, I think, um, well, it's on the one hand, I think it's it's more challenging because there's there's social media, there's lots to navigate in terms of the rules. But on the other hand, I think social media has played a significant part in pushing the conversation forward um, to the point that we've got to, and I'm, I'm sure we'll come on to that. But it's right that there's a huge amount to navigate here. So although, as Rob says, we've gone from a situation where the ISC's bylaw says you can't you can't participate in in advertising to, to one that says that you can we're in a situation where you don't know what you can and can't do on social media there's still a lot of restrictions there I think just turning to briefly if I made some of the principles that are included in in the rule you are allowed to continue to run what's referred to as generic advertising during the games period if they have permission from the athletes and no Olympic properties are used in the advertising. And it respects the policies of the IOC relating to the values of the Olympic movement and those of the athletes NOC. 
So what that means is in terms of generic advertising, it's defined as advertising that meets the following criteria, that the only connection between, on the one hand, the Olympics and NOC or an NOC, NOC's Olympic team and on the other that the, the relevant advertising activity is the fact that the advertising activity uses the participant's image. The advertising must have been in the market for at least 90 days prior to the games period and the advertising must run consistently and not be materially escalated during the games period. But you can imagine a situation where athletes are, of course, they're going to be using their social media more frequently during the Olympic Games because it's a it's a way in which people document their lives. And that's just accepted now. And, and of course, that period is going to be one where you're kind of more active in in sharing what's going on. So, yeah, social media adds an, a, an interesting dynamic. But but I do think it has been crucial in, in pushing the conversation forward in a positive way. Thanks for that, Donna. I think we can we can all tell how difficult it must be from athletes just thinking about those different criteria and sort of the, the multiple layers of rules that they've got to get through. But just following up on then about the point about social media driving change, Rob, I wonder if I could come to you to just ask about how this relaxation, you know, to the extent that it is a relaxation, has come about uh, and to, to what extent you think that athletes have driven that. Well, I think any change that we're seeing within the Olympic movement has been primarily been been led by athletes. And I'll expand on that in a second. But just building on something Carla said, and when it comes to going to the games, reading the documents, having to sign things away, it's mind boggling to think. If I told you tomorrow that I'm going to put on an event, I'm going to make a billion dollars, you're invited, but I'm not going to pay you. You're invited, but you're not allowed to use any sponsorships. So your sponsorships, you have to drop. And not only that, when all the image rights and your image rights and yourself and your likeness, you have to sign that back to me. So you get nothing. It's so far-fetched and stretched that when you start to talk about it, and I think that's why it's really important, Ben, that you're raising it and, and Carla is speaking up again uh, about it, because when you really look at it, it's so restrictive and there's an opportunity and we talk about social media, there's an opportunity for the IOC to leverage their brand, to leverage their most important stakeholder, their athletes, and to build the brand even further by empowering the athletes. So allowing them to use their own sponsorships, allowing them to promote the games on social media, whether that's video clips, because the reality is people are no longer follow events they follow athletes. So people are, are tuned in to watch people. Sure, there's team sports that people are interested, but there's a subcategory in team sports that you want to watch an individual. And that's why it's been so short-sighted from the IOC to see that potential. If you asked if you women's tennis, men's tennis, the PGA, the, the women's uh, golf, whether they have yielded benefits, they all have their own sponsors. They're all allowed to wear their own outfits. Has the sport suffered? Absolutely not. In fact, the, the, those sports have grown, the sponsorships have come, and it's been successful. So the fact that the IOC is not willing to, to think differently, to realize there's an opportunity here, not a challenge to the rule, but an opportunity to grow the brand, is short-sighted. And, and we need to continue to push for change and continue to show them why it can help them, not hurt them, by empowering the athletes more. Absolutely spot on. And and with regard to, to Rule 40 in particular, could you perhaps shed a bit of light on what in particular athletes have done to, to push for this change and you know, whether you think that the, those actions have been you know, particularly successful? Well, I mean, the first, you know, Carla can speak to this, obviously, but the first step was what Athletes Germany had done. And, I, and it just, it shows you that <laughs> to make change, not only do you have to be strong advocates, but you have to uh, use the legal powers that are, benefit you to force change within the IOC. And we've seen it in Rule 50, which is freedom of expression, but we've also seen it in Rule 40. I don't think it's, as I said, it, it has gone far enough. And I know Carla had mentioned that as well. And the, even the challenge in the UK, where there was a, a threat to challenge the BOA in terms of, of what they were allowing, it was so restrictive, it wasn't even close to what Germany had. And just that threat of, of, of a lawsuit, I think, is, is going to have to come even more stronger in the future. 
Just today, the NCAA, the athletes and, and the labor board said they should have the right to collectively bargain and they should have the right to be compensated. So it's the same as the, the Olympic athletes. They have that right to be compensated for a multi-billion dollar industry. And not to do that is, is, is again, it's outdated and it, it's totally wrong. It, they're stuck back 40 years ago when, when the movement wasn't making as much as it is now. And I, I think it's athletes going to have to push and continue to, to change. And, and final word on that is it's a multi-tiered system too. So the fact that Mo Farrell, after the Olympics, when he, when he runs, takes his Nike shoes off, wraps them around his neck, and shows the Nike logos, if it was someone else doing it that wasn't had, had a bigger standing, and if it wasn't Nike, you guarantee you that there'd be some repercussions. So it's a it's a privileged system and a multi tiered system that doesn't treat every athlete the same. So again, they don't practice what they pre- preach. Carla, coming to you then to pick up on on the point about the, the legal challenge in Germany. Could you tell us a little bit about how that came about and and what effect you think it's had? Yeah, I think the kickoff um, been made in Germany and uh, was two sides. It was first the Association Athletes Germany and the lawyer, um, Dr. Mark Ort. He um, was with Robert Harting, one athlete, and with my person on one side, and Athletes Germany uh, with uh, Dr. Sven Nagel uh, with a lawyer. So there were two sides going to the federal cartel office and yeah, blaming that it's uh, not working and that it's a uh, monopolism. So this was been made uh, 2017. So it's been already a couple of years and it uh, takes really long time to change l- little things. Yeah, but, but, it, but it got there in the end and it, it has made progress in Germany. And do, do you feel that, you know, being involved in that was, was something that has been rewarding in the end? Yeah, somehow it felt uh, really right from the first moment when 2017 um Mark Ort was uh, contacting me and asking if I want to join um, and if I'm in. I was totally ag- I agree agreeing to what he was saying. And I actually believe that it, it's going to be more quick, but it took over how many years to change little things. So um, somehow it's frustrating because they have problems to understand what we like, uh, especially in the beginning, they really had uh, problems to understand what's the point. So um, the more we talk about, the more global athletes is working and uh, us as athletes uh, sticking together and uh, bringing it to the media, talking about it. I think it's really important to get everybody to know what's happening in the background. Absolutely. And, and then Donna, coming to you on, on some of the more, more legal points then, perhaps you could explain, broadly speaking, the basis of the challenge and how it was brought. Yeah, sure. So as Carla said, this is something that that goes back to 2017 when the Germany's Federal Cartel Office opened an investigation on the application of Rule 40 in Germany, particularly following a complaint by the German Association of Sports and Goods Industry. And the the action was then supported, as Carla says, by by individual athletes and and the Association of, of German Athletes who intervened in the proceedings. So when the rules were relaxed in 2016 for the for the Olympic Games, national advertising campaigns involving German athletes, as elsewhere around the world, were subject to constraints, which German athletes and potential sponsors said were completely unclear and way too restrictive. So um, further to the SEO's investigations, the SEO came to the view that the, the application of Rule 40 did potentially constitute a breach of a dominant position in competition law terms. And so the advertising restrictions for German athletes were relaxed even further in a revised edition of the guidelines that were given to to German athletes before the 2018 Winter Olympics in Pyeongchang. For that Olympic Games, the guidelines were then subject to market tests, following which the FCO proposed further amendments which then formed the basis of the commitment decision that was reached between the IOC and the the German NOC. So because the investigations concluded with the commitment decision, the the legal side of things wasn't, wasn't formally tested, but the FCO did 
form the initial view that the IOC and the German NOC enjoyed a dominant position on the global market in terms of organising and marketing the Olympic Games and that the restrictions that were placed on athletes were so wide that they could amount to an abuse of that dominant position. So in terms of the commitment decision that was reached, the new guidelines for German athletes contained a number of, of key changes, which does differentiate the position in Germany compared with other countries. And these included that athletes were no longer required to get permission to implement a national ad campaign, provided it complies with the new guidelines with an individual sponsor during the blackout period. Athletes being allowed under certain conditions to receive congratulatory messages from their sponsors and being allowed to endorse their sponsors via social media. A reduction in the list of the Olympic related terms that athletes and their own sponsors were not allowed to use during the blackout period. For example, terms like games and gold, silver and bronze were prohibited, but this, these new guidelines removed those terms from, from the list. And then athlete sponsors being allowed to use photos of athletes taken at the Olympic Games, both competition and non-competition, provided that the campaign, again, complies with the guidelines and doesn't feature any of the precluded terms or symbols. And athletes being allowed to use their social media accounts for advertising purposes subject to the conditions of the guidelines. And interestingly, also confirmation that violations of Rule 40 and the new guidelines could lead to financial penalties, but crucially not sporting sanctions. So not exclusions, bans or stripping of medals or anything like that. And again, interestingly, that for, for disputes relating to Rule 40 and the new guidelines, recourse would be possible via the German civil courts as opposed to, to the Court of Arbitration for Sport. So. Seems like there's some some really positive advancements there, but there's still further to go. Um, these guidelines only relate to national campaigns focused on Germany and Switzerland and Austria, so it doesn't apply to international campaigns for any athletes, and also only applies to German athletes. So obviously, there's a hope that other countries and NOCs would follow suit, and you know, there's been a limited number of people who have sort of published relaxed guidelines as a result of, of the challenges made in Germany. As you say, that did lead to the British athletes making their own challenge and reaching a settlement with the British Olympic Association to sort of improve the, the opportunities the athletes in Britain had to use their image during the Olympic Games. But yeah, so some good things happen there but there's there's still more more room for, for movement and advancements I think. Yeah thanks and, and Rob I'd come to you uh, to talk about the, the UK challenge I, you know, I won't ask you to go into details but from, from your experience of, of that do you feel that there are there is room for further legal challenge I know you said you don't feel the guidelines go, go far enough but do you think there's room for further legal challenges perhaps? Absolutely I think this is just the beginning the status quo, again, the the headline wars that the IOC seem to steal don't really match what they're giving athletes. And that's where, if you look what the UK athletes had done, there's two things they had done. One, they, they collectively got together. So they had a group, a, a strong group of athletes that were challenging the BOA, the British Olympic Association. And not only that, they had legal expertise backing them. So they had both things that make national Olympic committees very uneasy and, and worried because they're all trying to protect their brands. They're all trying to look like they're athletes first. If you read every terms of reference or annual report from a national Olympic committee, from IOC, from the IPC, it's all of always athletes first. <laughs> but if you look at what athletes actually get, it's probably athletes last. So I think there's momentum. I think this is a topical point right now that you're bringing forward with Beijing around the corner and and Paris even closer now that the Tokyo Games were delayed. So we need to continue the conversation. We need to continue to push. And we want to work on something that can show the IOC how they can yield benefits from it and not feel like they're being punished or having resources or revenues taken away, but can actually help them grow their own, their own brand. 
Mm. And, and Carla, do you, do you feel like there's still a desire within within Germany, within, within athletes in Germany, to continue pushing there? Yeah, there's a, the must. Uh, there it has to be pushed in every country so that we have a unified voice. And as Rob just said, it's so important to talk about it, to get media appearance, to stick together, to to talk like we do actually right now, that um, a lot of athletes know what we are talking about, because I still believe that a lot of athletes who participated uh, in Tokyo have no idea <laughs> about what we are talking right now. So um, I, I guess because it's uh, for the benefit for the athlete that everybody who knows the topic and uh, who knows uh that we need to push uh, will um, help help us. Uh, so I think it's really, really important to yeah, have organizations like Global Athletes to start talking here, to start talking to all the athletes we know, to, to really uh, be heard by the IOC once. And I think in general, what I wanted still to add, in my opinion, would be fair if athletes would uh, benefit from the earnings of the IOC. That's also a really important part. We talked at the beginning already a little. And um, as Rob mentioned, how much money they earn with our stories, with our bodies at the end. So I think it's we are at the beginning, uh, but there's still um, a long process to come. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and Donna, just going back to you about you know potential further further developments on on this front, do you, do you feel that that there is some justification for having restrictions, you know, for having some restrictions, or, or do you think you know there could be a challenge to the very principle of, of restrictions being placed on athletes' ability to advertise in this way? Yeah, well, I, I think I, I suppose in 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 legal terms, obviously looking at competition law, a key principle there is is on proportionality. So, uh, arguably, some sort of balance is probably appropriate. And in reaching its conclusions, the Germany's FCO recognised that there are proper reasons for restricting athletes' advertising opportunities to ensure the ongoing organisation for the Olympic Games key question is is whether the restrictions affecting athletes' economic activity can be justified in accordance with the um, European Court of Justice case law on sporting rules. And, and under this case law, such sporting rules can be justified if it pursues a legitimate objective relating to the organisational and proper conduct of competitive sport. Its effects are inherent in pursuing that objective and the restriction is proportionate. So the, the FCO in Germany acknowledged that preventing ambush marketing was a legitimate aim. However, it formed the initial view that, that as I said earlier, certain restrictions, like not using the terms like games and gold and silver and bronze, is far too, too strict. Just looking at ambush marketing, I mean, I really don't think there's a huge risk to the IOC by allowing athletes to you know, thank all of their many sponsors as opposed to just a few sponsors, you know, limiting the numbers in some way. There, there doesn't appear to be a huge risk of ambush marketing there. So, but it is, as Rob says, about continuing to engage with the IOC, seeing that, that you know, trying to get them to, to see how much of a benefit it is to the brand of the Olympics to allow athletes to to push themselves forward and, and, and exploit their economic rights and just, you know, to get as much traction as possible for the Olympic Games. So, so yeah, I can see that there's an argument that you need balance, but at the moment it's just way too, too far not in favour of the athletes. And actually the re reality is that, that that is to the detriment of, of pushing the Olympic Games forward and making it the best spectacle that it can it can possibly be mm. and, and taking that further rob back but coming back to you you know if, if we were to accept that i mean do, do you accept that some guidelines might be necessary and if so in an ideal world what, what would those guidelines look like yeah i, I want to go back to something carla said and, and it does kind of answer your question carla said something really important and she talked about the you know athletes going and, and competing and not being compensated so this this is where this is a whole we can't get stuck on rule 40 we can't get stuck on image rights signing the way we can't get stuck on not being paid we need to look at the whole business model from an athlete's perspective and say if the business model is broken 
because athletes shouldn't have to have parents, have friends, have go to GoFundMe pages to support and help them train and prepare for the Olympic Games. Okay, if it wasn't a multi-billion dollar industry and it was back to the amateurism kind of approach that was 25 years ago, maybe there's a different argument. But today it's professionalized. Athletes are bringing in the revenues and they're the reason that the IOC and the IPC is making so much money. So I think the whole business model needs to be addressed from an athlete's perspective. And a fair way, and, and we talk about collective bargaining, <laughs> that that's what we're talking about in the end, is the, the ability for athletes to collectively bargain. And collective bargaining is always about fairness on both sides. So the sport has to succeed and the athletes have to succeed. And that exposing that, I think, is, is the crucial element. Because if you talk to the average fan that watches the Olympic Games, that's not tied into it every, all year long, but they turn on their TV for two weeks or whatever it may be, if just over two weeks, they will think that all these athletes are famous, are driving fancy cars, are just amazing people, and they're so lucky to be Olympians. When the reality is, is that most can barely pay rent. They have to take loans. They have to look for money. And I think showing and exposing that these these talented individuals that are putting the show on are not getting anything on all aspects and are being limited is what needs to happen. And again, showing the strength of why the athletes should be or should receive something in return. The Olympic solidarity model that they trump and they talk about is again rhetoric. It's not the realities, and that's where athletes rightfully should be compensated for competing or let them leverage their own sponsors to make money off them for themselves to support their own careers because it's not working right now. Yeah, I, th- I think we're, we're, we're all, all agreed on that. And Carla, if I could come to you, just perhaps to finish, actually, to ask, you know, what would you want to be able to have from the IOC or be allowed to do from the IOC from an athlete's perspective? You know, what, what would you most like to get out of being an Olympic athlete? Yeah, my my wish is that they really focus on the athlete and that it's all about the athlete because without us, there wouldn't be any Olympics. And yeah, in terms of earnings, uh, for sure, um, it's not a situation where athletes at home, they sacrifice so much with their body, with their families. They don't have a normal life, let's say this. They sacrifice so much. So um, I think it's important that we also benefit from what the IOC is taking. So this is uh, if, uh, my hope or my wish for the future. And I believe things are changing, but still it's Paris is for the summer games. Um, I mean, it's just three years. And if we imagine from 2017, there was just little changes. So uh, it's really, yeah, about us to push uh, that... Uh, anything uh, is changing uh, soon absolutely well, i think that's a, that's a nice way to end but i think we can all hope that by the time the paris games come around things will have changed further and, and that we are you know further down the line towards athletes being properly compensated for, for what they bring to the olympic movement and that the ioc will recognize their value but for now that that is all we have time for so thanks very much to carla robin donna for, for, for giving your time and for such a great discussion If you've enjoyed this episode, please do rate, review and subscribe wherever you get your podcast. And do check out our earlier episode on Rule 50 of the Olympic Charter with Nikki Dryden and Cara O'Donovan. For information about Morgan Sports Law and for articles about athletes' rights issues, please visit www.morgansl.com. And if you'd like to join our mailing list or if there are any topics you'd like to suggest for a future podcast episode, please email us at podcast at morgansl.com. And finally, please do connect with us on social media at Morgan Sports Law on Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn and Facebook for articles, updates and news. Thank you very much for listening and we'll hope you join us again soon.